read that Bible through in one year. It didn't take me 12 months. In about 10 months, I had read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and devoured the Bible. And I even have that Bible in my office, in, in, a, in my desk, and it's, it's falling apart. The pages are falling apart. So many notes in there. That, that's what got me into the Word and got the Word into me. And that's when I fell in love with the Word of God. And I've never gotten over that love affair with the Bible. And every day, and I know I've probably missed a day here and there, but virtually every day of my Christian life, I have taken time to read the Bible. Maybe it's a verse, maybe it's a passage, maybe it's a chapter, maybe it's a whole book. This morning I sat down and I read all of Psalm 119 and all of Psalm 1 and all, Psalm, all of Psalm 19 because those three Psalms have to do with the Word of God. And I knew I was speaking today on the Word of God and I just want to feed my own soul with the Word of God. But the Bible, I fell in love with the Bible and I decided to go to school to learn more about the Bible and I, I've dedicated my life to teach and preach the Bible. And when it comes to pastoring, I love pastoring. But if I couldn't preach or teach, I would not be a pastor. Because that's the favorite part of being a pastor is studying and teaching and preaching the Word of God. And as a parent, I feel it's my responsibility to teach my kids the Word of the Lord. And it's your responsibility. And so I want to talk today about the Bible and, and what we learn about the Bible from this passage. And I want to make three declarations about the Bible. The first is that the Bible is trustworthy. The second is that the Bible is timeless. And the third is that the Bible is transforming. That, that means it transforms our life. Let, let's look, first of all, at the Bible is trustworthy. If you notice here in verse 16 of chapter 3, this is the strongest statement in the Bible about the Bible. And what Paul says here is all Scripture is God-breathed or all Scripture is inspired by God. And, and it literally means God-breathed. And it's not talking about like there's an existing book that already was written and then God breathed into it and made it the Word of God. No, that's not what it's saying. It's saying God breathed out the Word of God. God spoke forth His Word, and this Word, even though it was written by men, you have Luke and Paul and James and Moses who, who penned the, the different books of the Bible, even though they wrote it, they were overseen and directed by the hand of God and inspired by the Holy Spirit so that what we have in our hands and in our possession today is the Word of the Lord. This is the Word of the Lord, and it's trustworthy. It says all Scripture is God-breathed. From Genesis to Revelation, every book in the Bible, every chapter in the Bible, every verse in the Bible, the parts of the Bible that you don't like, they're inspired by God. The parts in the Bible that you never read, they're inspired by God. I remember hearing the story by uh, Dr. Dennis F. Kinlaw. He was a former president of Asbury College and a great preacher and scholar. And he went to uh, Princeton, and he was there at the seminary in Princeton, and he had a professor who was actually a godly professor, and he, he had his Bible open, and the professor was teaching them that day about how all of the Bible is important, all of the Bible is relevant. All of the Bible is useful. And he said to his students, he said, the verses in your Bible that aren't underlined are just as inspired as the verses that are underlined. He said he just closed his Bible right then because he had some verses underlined and some verses not underlined. And there's nothing wrong with underlining verses in your Bible. Maybe they mean something to you. You went through a trial in your life. You had to make a decision, and God used a verse to help you. But don't ever forget that those verses that aren't underlined are just as inspired as the ones that are underlined. And the verses that aren't red-lettered are just as inspired as the verses that are red-lettered. All Scripture is inspired by God. All Scripture 
is God breathed. It says here, if you look again at 2 Timothy 3, it refers to the Bible as holy scriptures. The word scriptures means writings. And so he's calling the Bible holy writings. And when he calls it holy writings, he's saying writings that are set apart, writings that are unique, writings that are from God. And so when you think about the Bible, the Bible is set apart. The Bible is unique. The Bible is from God. So I have many books, and I love to read, and I have read so many books, and usually I'm reading about four or five or six or seven or eight or nine or ten books at the same time. I just love to read, but there's no book more important than the Bible. And I don't trust any book like I trust the Bible. I don't love any book like I love the Bible. I don't believe in any book like I believe in the Bible. The Bible is a book that's set apart from all other books. And so you have Homer's Odyssey, and you have Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities, and you have Dante's Inferno, and all these different books that are known as classics. But let me tell you, this is the classic. It's the best-selling book of all time. There's no book that's ever sold more than the Bible. Because this Bible is holy writings. It's holy scriptures, which means it's set apart, it's unique. It's from the Lord. Thus says the Lord. It's trustworthy. It's believable. There's no book like the Bible. And we need to teach our children the Bible. Now, we have Sunday school. Thank the Lord. I appreciate all of our Sunday school teachers those that teach our children the Bible. And our kids will come home and they'll have um, little projects that they've done and Bible verses that they've learned and they'll tell us about the lesson. Love Sunday school teachers. Children's church, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Our family life pastor, Josh, and his wife, Amy. I thank the Lord for all of the different programs in the church. But I want to remind you as parents, and the same is true with Jenny and myself, the primary person responsible for teaching your children the Bible is not the church. It's not Middletown Christian School. It's not Sunday school. It's you. And it's me. God will hold us responsible for whether or not we have taught our children the Bible. We can't delegate this to someone and say, well, I'm just going to pass it off to you. You get it done. No, we have a responsibility to teach our children the Word of God and to teach them from infancy. It says here how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures. Let me, let me tell you three, three things that you should teach your children as it relates to the Bible. First of all, teach your children to read the Bible. You know, we have them read all of these nursery rhymes, and we allow them to watch movies on the iPad, and, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. You know, we let them watch Disney movies, and we let them read different books, and there's nothing wrong with that. But there is something wrong there's something majorly wrong if our kids read all the nursery rhymes and watch all the Disney movies and they never get around to ever reading the Bible. What does that say about us as parents? It says that our primary goal is simply to entertain our kids or maybe to educate them on certain facts of life, but we need to say this is the most important book in the world. This is the most important document in the world. This is more important than anything else they'll ever learn is the Bible. And when they go off to college someday, we want them to get a degree. But even there, they can learn how to do this or learn how to do that or learn about this field of study. Where are they going to learn the Bible? At home. And if they don't learn it at home, let me, let me tell you something. Some of your children are going to go off to college one day, and some of these colleges are not Christian colleges or universities, and they're going to undercut the authority of Scripture. They're going to undercut the inspiration of Scripture, and they're going to say it's full of fables, and they're going to say this book is no different than any other book. And if you haven't rooted them in the Word of God in your own life and in their heart, they will not be able to stand when they go to college or university. That's not the time to try to help them. It's right now to ground them in the word of the Lord. Teach your children to read the Bible. But parents, let me ask you this. Do you read the Bible yourself? 
I love when I'm sitting in my bed and I have my iPad and I'm reading and grandma will say, Dad, what are you doing? I'm reading the Bible, son. I'm reading the Bible. I love when Graham catches me reading the Bible. And I want him to catch me reading the Bible over and over and over again. And I want to catch him on my knee. I want him to catch me on my knees in prayer over and over and over again. Because I want him to see that his daddy is a man that reads the Bible, loves the Bible, believes the Bible, and lives out the Bible. That's what I want him to see. And, but we can't teach our, children's to read, our children to read the Bible if we never read the Bible. And then we need to teach our children to believe the Bible. Teach them to believe it. Teach them to know that it's true, it's trustworthy, that there's no book like the Bible, that we can believe its promises, and we should connect the dots for our children. This is where I think a lot of Christian parents miss it. And I'm no expert, and we're learning as we go, as all parents do. You, it's on-the-job learning. You have to connect the dots between your life and the Bible. And so when it comes to teaching them to believe the Bible, and you're going through a difficulty in your life, and you say to your children, you know, I know God is going to work this out. Because the Bible teaches us, with God, all things are possible. You've connected the dots. It's not them just looking at you and saying, oh, my daddy's so strong and he can get through anything. No, you let them know, I, I believe that we're going to get through this because of the promises of the Bible. Maybe they're in school and they have a decision to make. Dad, I don't know what I ought to do. I don't know if I should major in this or major in that. I don't know if I should... Uh, take this girl out or not. Dad, I don't know. What do you think? Well, son, you know the Bible says in James 1, 5, if anyone lacks wisdom, let them ask God, and he will give it to them generously without finding fault. Let's, let's pray right now that God would give you wisdom because if you pray, God will do it. Do you see how you connect the dots? And you take them back to the promises of the Bible in their life and in your life. And what a lot of parents do, and even though they're good Christian parents, they never connect the dots with their kids. And so their kids are raised in the church, but they're never fully Christianized because the dots have never been connected for them. You have to teach your children to believe the Bible. But again, do we ourselves believe the Bible? And then teach your children to obey the Bible. Teach them to conduct their lifestyle in accordance with the Word of God. Again, you have to connect the dots. Painful experience in their life. They have a friend who betrayed them. Someone that said something that was untrue about them. And they're having a hard time dealing with it. It was a friend. It was a confidant. Dad, Mom, I don't know what to do. Well, let's go over to Colossians 3.13 that says, Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. And son, I know that what they did was not right. But I want you to know there will be times in your life that people treat you unfairly. And there will be times in your life when people will not treat you in a Christian way. But you have to be the bigger man. You have to be the bigger person. And you need to forgive that person because Jesus Christ died on the cross and forgave you in spite of all of your sins. And you've got to forgive as the Lord forgave you. Do you see how you're always connecting it back to the Word of God? Not just back to moral principles in general. Not connecting it back to what someone says on a talk show. Show, but you're always connecting life back to the promises of Scripture, to the commands of Scripture, to the examples of Scripture, so they just grow up as a Bible Christian. And it's their native breath. They don't understand anything else but being a Bible Christian. That's why you can come to church and you can be a Christian and you can take your kids to Sunday school and church and never fully Christianize them because you haven't connected the dots, their everyday life back to Scripture. They're not going to do it on their own. We have to do that. And so you teach your children to read the Bible. You teach your children to believe the Bible. You teach your children to obey the Bible. The Bible should be just part of your everyday life. Talking about the Bible, having your kids memorize verses of the Bible, 
I had Graham memorize a verse the other day, and he says it, rejoice in the Lord always. <laughs> That's good enough. Rejoice in the Lord always. They don't even have to get the reference right. That's great if he can say Philippians 4, 4, but that, that's not the most important thing. It's that you know the word. And why did I teach him that verse? Because his attitude was not the greatest the other day. <laughs> and I said, I got a verse for you, Graham. Rejoice in the Lord always. Next one I'm going to teach him is obey your father and mother. <laughs> I'm just going to take him right down the line. <laughs> He's a great kid, but he is a kid, and we just you got to teach him. And so the Bible is trustworthy. Well, the second declaration about the Bible is the Bible is timeless. And, and when I say it's timeless, I mean it's relevant. And it's timeless and it's relevant for it teaches us the plan of salvation. You're not going to learn the plan of salvation anywhere else but in the Bible. Even when you think about the created order, it says the heavens declare the glory of God, and, and in the firmament we see his handiwork, but the, the creation cannot tell me the plan of salvation. I can't look at the moon and the stars and the galaxies and the waterfalls and the beautiful landscape and say, oh, I'm a sinner and I need Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. You don't get that from creation. You may see there's a God and that you're tiny and he's big, but you only learn the plan of salvation from the Bible. And that's why any church that has disregarded the Bible is no longer a church of the living God because you have to preach and teach the Bible. But it's in the Bible that you learn the plan of salvation. Notice what it says. You have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, when, when Paul wrote 2 Timothy, it was toward the end of his life, the New Testament was not in existence. I mean, there were some books of the New Testament, but there wasn't a thing we call the New Testament. So when he says all Scripture, he's referring to the Old Testament. Now, we also know the New Testament's inspired by God, written by the apostles under, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But when, when Paul was writing, he's talking about the Old Testament. So even in the Old Testament, the plan of salvation is made known through faith in Christ Jesus. Let me tell you how salvation does not come about. It's not by faith in God. You say, oh, I believe in God. I know there's a God. He's the man upstairs. You can believe in God and still not be right with God. The majority of the world believes in God. I ask you, which God are you talking about? Talking about Allah? You talking about the God of some other religion? Just to say, I believe in God, God is a generic term. To say, I believe in God, which God? So, just believing in God does not save you. Read James 2.19. It says, even the demons believe there is one God and they tremble. Demons believe in one God. Demons have a theological education, but they're not converted unto Christ. Believing in God is not enough. You say, oh, I believe in God. I'm a good person through faith in Christ Jesus, not faith in yourself. Now, I want to say something to all the Christian parents here today and grandparents. What we have to be careful of is when we teach our children that we don't teach them more about just what our culture believes than what we do actually what the Bible teaches we're more affected by our culture than we realize. Let me give you a for instance. How many of you teach your children you need to believe in yourself? How many of you say to your children a lot, you need to believe in yourself? I wish you could show me one verse in the Bible. I'm not talking about two. I'm not talking about three. I wish you could show me one verse in the Bible that teaches us that we should believe in ourselves. You will not find a single verse that says believe in yourself. 
you will find a host of verses that says, believe in the Lord. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Bible has a more accurate picture of ourselves than we do. The Bible presents us as fallen. The Bible presents us as weak. The Bible presents us as sinful. The Bible presents us in need of a Savior. The Bible says don't trust yourself. Don't trust your heart. It's deceitfully wicked and beyond cure. Trust in God alone. But we tell our kids all the time, you just need to believe in yourself. Well, I'm not saying teach your kids to have low self-esteem, and I know we want them to have confidence, but I want my children to have confidence not because they believe in their own abilities, but they believe in God Almighty that has empowered them to do what he has called them to do. Because if your message to your kids is believe in yourself, 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 then how are you going to get salvation across to them? In all of life, you've told them, just believe in yourself. And now all of a sudden, you're saying, well, but when it comes to salvation, you need to actually believe in Jesus, not yourself. So you're saying, I can do anything I want in life. I can be anything I want to be. I can just do anything. You know, you could come up to me and say, Mark, if you just believed in yourself, you could go over to Hutchison Hall and dunk a basketball. If you just believed in yourself... No, I couldn't. No, I couldn't. You need to know that it's not in your strength. It's not in your abilities. It's in the Lord. And that's why I'm saying, if you don't know the Bible, you can be teaching your kids things that you think are good Christian concepts that can be totally contrary to the Bible. It's not faith in yourself. It's faith in the Lord. And it's not faith in your parents. 2 Timothy 1.5 says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. Thank God for Christian parents and Christian grandparents and Christian great-grandparents, but your faith can't be in your parents. Oh, my mom is a Christian. My dad's a Christian. My, my dad's on the board, or my, my dad's a pastor. That's, that's wonderful, but you have to make a decision yourself to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can't get into heaven on the coattails of your family. Or what about this? Not faith in a past experience. It's where a lot of people are. You say, are you a Christian? Are you a follower of Christ? Well, I prayed a prayer when I was 12. I was baptized when I was 10. Joined the church when I was 20. Went forward about 10 years ago. Show me a verse in the Bible that says, put your faith in what happened years ago. It doesn't talk about past experiences. It talks about present reality. Where is your faith right now? I'm not worried about were you baptized years ago or did you come forward years ago? Do you right now believe that Jesus Christ is the one and only Savior? Are you following him? Do you love him? Do you obey him? That's where the Bible emphasis is, not on some past experience that may have no relevancy to your life today. It's where are you right now? There are a lot of people, let me tell you, let me just say to you as a pastor, let me just warn you. There are a lot of people today that feels secure, and it's a false security. They feel like they're right with God because of some past experience that has no impact on their life today. They don't love the Bible. They don't love really even being around Christian people that much. Church is simply something they have to do. They don't spend any time in prayer Their life is not God-centered. But I had that experience years ago. You got to be careful. Faith in Christ Jesus. Faith that he is the son of God, that he died on the cross for our sins, that he was resurrected on the third day, and entrusting your life and and entrusting your eternal destiny into his care, putting all of your eggs in one basket. 
Not saying, well, I'll learn a little bit about Hinduism and a little bit about Islam and a little bit about Judaism and some good works and, and some talk show advice and then I'll get a little bit of Bible and what grandmother told me and what my neighbor says. I'm going to put my eggs in all these baskets because surely one of them is right. You put all your eggs in one basket and that basket's Jesus. They're, all your eggs are in that basket. If I'm wrong here, I'm wrong in all my life. I am betting all my life. I'm going to live my life for Jesus. I'm going to conduct my life for Jesus. I'm going to do whatever he tells me to do. And I'm going to believe when I die, I'm going to heaven. All of my eggs are in the basket of Jesus Christ and him alone. That's faith. Faith in Jesus. The Bible is timeless. We have one last declaration and that is the Bible is transforming. The Bible is what helps us grow as Christians. So if you're here today and your Christian life is the same as it was 10 years ago, this is a danger. Someone becomes a Christian and they grow that first month and they grow that second month and they grow that third month and they grow that first year and they grow that second year, then they hit a plateau they don't want to grow anymore. Just going to stay right here. You can't stay right there. If you're not going forward, you're going backward. You can't have it both ways. You can't say, I'm just going to stay right here. Because once you stay right here, you're going to start drifting. You're either going forward or you're going backward. There is no in between. And the Bible is what helps us grow as Christians. As I've mentioned several times, the Christian life is like a plant. You take a plant. It needs three important things to grow. It needs water. It needs some dirt or soil. And it needs sunlight. Any plant needs these three. And, and as Christians, what do we need to grow? We need the Bible. We need prayer. And we need Christian fellowship. It's really not that complicated. You need the Bible, you need prayer, and you need Christian fellowship. And what do we learn here? If you look back again at, at uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is God-breathed, inspired by God, and is useful. Why is all Scripture useful? Because all Scripture is inspired. They go together. But it says here, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. You have the negative and you have the positive. Positive is teaching and training. The negative is rebuking and correcting. You have an emphasis on beliefs and behavior, orthodoxy and orthopraxy, correct knowledge of God and Christ-like behavior before God. As one translation puts it, it's for, the te it's for teaching the truth and refuting error for reformation of manners and discipline in right living. That's what the Bible does. The Bible corrects us. The Bible rebukes us. The Bible teaches us. The Bible trains us. The Bible impacts my beliefs, my theology, how I look at things, what I believe about God. Where do I get my doctrine of God? Where do I, where do I get my doctrine of Christ? Where do I get my doctrine of salvation? Where do I get my doctrine of really any belief? The Bible. And it impacts my lifestyle. How do I live? I live in light and under the authority of the Bible. But you know, a lot of people, they, they see this book and they think, well, I'm, I'm over the book. I, I, what I like, I'll accept. What I like, I'll put into practice but the rest I'll leave out. It's like when you go to that buffet. I'm not big in buffets. Stand back and watch that buffet for about 20 minutes and see what happens around that buffet. I'm not OCD, but I understand OCD people, amen? <laughs> but when you go to that buffet, oh, I like... I like green beans. I like corn. 
I like, oh, I don't want that. I'm going to leave that there. I'm going to leave that there. I'm going to leave that there. And you can also take it. You know what's wonderful? One wonderful thing about the buffet? You can get a whole big thing of food and just eat a little bit of it and say, you know, I really don't like this. You can set it aside and go get a brand new plate. You can't treat the Bible that way. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this out. Yeah, I, I, no, actually, I don't like that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn that aside. Do you know what would be scary if, if you had to honestly take the Bible and begin ripping out pages that you don't believe, that you don't live, and then you don't obey? How many pages would be left in our Bibles? Not a lot. It's all inspired by God. And let me tell you, the Bible sometimes rebukes you. It's not me. Don't blame me. When you get that bill in the mailbox, don't blame the mailman. It wasn't his fault. You're the one that ran up the credit card, not him. He's just delivering the goods. I'm the mailman here. Don't get mad at me when the Bible rebukes you and corrects you and and steps on your toes a little bit. That's the Bible's job. And, and yet the Bible sometimes corrects us and rebukes us. I remember when I was at Asbury College, they had a devotional night, and you could come to, uh, it was maybe on like a Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. It said, come hear a word of encouragement. 7 o'clock, such and such a place. Of course, I went. But I later thought, what if it had said, come hear a word of rebuke? <laughs> 7 o'clock. I wonder how many people would have come. We want the encouragement, don't we? Oh, we want to be lifted up. And, but the Bible also rebukes us. It corrects us. Look back at 2 Timothy 3. Verse 14 says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned. This word continue is the Greek word "meno." It means to abide, to remain, to continue in. It's the same word used multiple times in John chapter 15 when Jesus said, and he said, if you abide in me, same word, and I abide in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And in that chapter, go back and look at how many times you see the word remain or continue or abide. It's like nine or ten times. And, and here it's the same word, abide in my word, continue in my word, remain in my word. And I believe what we learn from this is you can't abide in Christ if you don't abide in the word of God. You can't do it. And so if you say to the Bible, I'm just going to set you aside and I'm going to just try to live this Christian life on my own. You can't do it. You can't set it aside. And I know you're not going to literally set it aside, but how many of us set it aside on a daily basis because we don't read it, we don't believe it, we don't obey it, we don't teach our children the Bible. We teach our children everything but the Bible. And it's not that hard. Kids love to learn. You can connect the ABCs to the Bible verses. You can teach them the books of the Bible. Kids love to learn. And what will happen is you get that word in their heart. They won't forget it. And it will begin to impact their lives. God will bring it back to their attention. God can't bring back a verse if you don't have it in your heart to begin with. The Bible says, hide God's word in your heart that you may not sin against him. You know, in closing, you can tell a lot about someone by their appetite. If I went to see my doctor and I sat down and I said, I don't know what's going on, but I have no appetite. Haven't eaten for days. My wife makes my favorite meals. We went out to our favorite restaurants. I just take my fork and move the food around and take a bite or two and... I'm not that hungry. If I went to my doctor and said, I have no appetite, I mean, I have no desire for food, she would say, there's something not right here, right? Something not right here. Are you depressed? Is there some type of physio physiological issue here? We need to run some tests. 
because a normal, healthy person has a normal, healthy appetite. You want to eat. You want to eat foods that you like. If you're healthy as a Christian, you're going to have an appetite for the Bible. You're going to read it. You say, well, I don't even understand it. You understand a lot more than you realize. A lot more than you realize. And you pray for the Holy Spirit to help you to understand it. But if you have no love for the Bible, no desire to read the Bible, you don't even believe in the Bible, you have a life that is unhealthy. And you might not even be born again. At the very least, you've drifted from God. And so let's pray as a church that the Lord would rekindle our appetite for the word of the Lord to have an insatiable desire for Scripture. It says in 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. You grow by the word of the Lord. This is not just for parents and grandparents. It's for all of us. Josh dedicated the whole church. I want my children to see Bible Christians all throughout this sanctuary. I want my children to see you loving the Bible, reading the Bible, believing in the Bible, teaching the Bible, because it'll just be a Bible atmosphere, a Bible atmosphere. That's what we want, an atmosphere that points back to Christ. I want you to stand with me. We're going to have a season of prayer and a few songs of praise. Maybe you'd just like to come and pray. There's no pressure on anyone here today. We just usually end with some time of prayer. Maybe you'd like to come and, and pray. If you'd like to pray by yourself, you can feel free to do that. Just come and pray, and we will um, re respect your privacy. Maybe you'd like for someone to pray with you. You can grab someone or some of the prayer team. Just raise your hand. We'd be glad to come and pray with you. But maybe on this Mother's Day or you're a mother yourself, or maybe you're not a mother, but you would like to come and just say, Lord, help me to be a Bible Christian and to raise my kids to be Bible Christians. Father, we pray right now as we sing some songs of praise and give everyone an opportunity to come and pray. Forgive us, God. Forgive us, God, that we have not loved your word the way we should. Forgive us, God, that we've been so preoccupied with life that sometimes our kids learn everything but the Bible. And forgive us, God, for delegating the teaching of Scripture to someone else and forgetting that it's our responsibility. And if they don't see it in us, it won't matter what they learn at school or Sunday school or children's church because if old mom and dad aren't doing it, it won't make that big of a difference. Lord, help us to live out the faith we claim to believe in, to be real, sincere Christians and have a sincere faith. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You feel free to come and pray if you'd like.